in another way that we're all familiar with, kind of proof that these solving problems with pictures actually works. You don't really have to take my word for it, because let me ask you this. How many people in this room have children who have been in kinder through kindergarten or are presently in kindergarten? Have kids who have been through kindergarten? Now, how many people in this room have themselves been through kindergarten? <laughs> and, and if you didn't make it through, it's okay. You don't have to raise your hand. Now, think about this. Walk into a kindergarten class, and of course, with the teacher's permission, ask the six-year-olds by a show of hands, how many of them can draw? And every single hand is going to go up. And then ask them, okay, how many of you can read and write? And two hands are going to go up, and they're not sure because they don't really know what you're talking about. <laughs> and there may be some, there may be a kindergartner who actually, who really can read and write, but it's really the exception. It's one maximum two in that room. Now come back to that same class 10 years later, 16 year olds in 10th grade, and ask the same two questions. What do you think is going to happen? How many of you can draw? Two or three hands are going to go up. How many of you can read and write? Every hand's going to go up. Do not get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with us needing to know how to read and write. That is absolutely fundamental. But what is wrong is something happens from the time we're about six until the time we're about 10, 16, 36, 46, 56. Nobody continues to tell us how to take advantage of this incredible vision system that we already had built in from the day that we were born. And that's what I really want to share with you. As I have had this opportunity over the last couple of years to talk to this amazing array of, of, of businesses, and I want to hear from you if you agree with some of these things after this, is I have been able to, to just see that there are certain recurrent themes about solving problems with pictures. They just come up time and time again. They're fundamental, like the underpinnings of this whole concept. And I'm going to, I'm going to relate just two of them to you today. I've actually found four of them, but there's only two of them that we're going to talk about today. And the first one, we're going to call this Unwritten visual thinking rule number one. It's very simple and it says this. Whoever best describes the problem is the person most likely to solve the problem. So you can think about this in the following way. The problem might be how are we going to address this economic downturn? It's a pretty big problem. The problem might be how are we going to address global climate change? The problem might be, how am I going to make sure I get to the airport on time tomorrow? Whatever the problem is, the person who has the clearest idea of what are the pieces that actually make up this problem, what are the moving parts, who are the characters involved, where do they interact, how many of them are there, at what points, where are they physically located, and when do they need to interact? What are the moving pieces of this problem? The person who can articulate that is automatically the one who already is probably looking at most of the solution, as opposed to the, problem, the person who says, We've got to solve, solve global warming. Okay, well, what does that mean? So the subtext, the mercenary subtext here, and I don't say this to everyone, is that literally whoever draws the best picture gets the funding. Because when it comes time for the person who has the money to give that money to you for you to go out and solve that problem, they're going to be looking at the fact that you have created this picture that describes the problem in a way that is clear to them. And they will believe that you can actually solve this problem better than the person who's just out there waving their arms around it. And you are going to get the money. Let me give you a couple of examples. A couple of visualization examples. The first one, I, I, we, we have to both move in time and space. We're going to move back to Texas, to 1967. Is there anybody here from Texas? Wow, there's a lot of people here from Texas. Is there anybody here who was in Texas in 1967? Okay, so this is for you. Now, yeah, well, there's one right there. So we have, to, we have a special guest in the audience, two special guests. My dad and my stepmother are both here visiting. They live in Florida, so they came. So Texas 1967. Now let's say, as we're going through this example, that as this Texas business person, our office is in Houston, but we also have a lot of operations in Dallas, and maybe we have some other operations in San Antonio, because those are the three big metropolitan areas in Texas. And we all know Texas is a big state. So we're tired of driving from Houston to Dallas because it's a five-hour drive. That's a long way to go. So what we did do is we decided that we're going to just fly. So we're going to call the airline. So the first one we call in 1967 in Houston is we call Continental, big airline. They fly out of Houston. And sure enough, there they are in Houston, and we need to fly to Dallas. Well, guess what? There's no connecting flights. That's okay. We've got other airlines. Let's try American. They fly to Houston, they do not fl they fly to Dallas, but they do not connect Houston to Dallas, unless you want to go through Chattanooga. So we say that's okay, because we've got the biggest airline of all, we've got Braniff. 
Braniff flies to Houston, and you guys can't see it on this map, but it, Braniff does in fact fly both to Houston and to Dallas, and no, Braniff does not connect. In 1967, you could not fly direct from Houston to Dallas. So two guys are sitting in a bar. You knew this was coming. St. Anthony's Club, downtown San Antonio, 1967. Believe it or not, it's Rollin and it's Herb. And Rollin says to Herb, hey Herb, I have an idea for an airline. And Rollin pulls out a cocktail napkin at the bar, and he says, you know, in Texas here, we have these three big metropolitan areas. We have Dallas, Houston, and San Antonio. Why don't we just make an airline that connects those three cities? And he do that triangle. This, of course, was the napkin that was the start of Southwest Airlines. Southwest Airlines started on the back of a napkin. That was the picture that Roland King drew to Herb. And Herb said, that's a great idea. Now, the interesting thing, the subtext here, is that Southwest Airlines is the only airline that has been profitable since the day it started. And on top of that, as of a month ago, which was the last time I checked, in the United States one month ago, Southwest Airlines was the only profitable airline in the United States. So I attribute all of that success to the fact that it started on the back of a napkin. <laughs> and I like Southwest Airlines. And to this day, Southwest Airlines is the only airline I've flown on that continues to print their route map on their cocktail napkins.